16. Why did they pick Merced? My first day in Merced, several months before I met the Lees, I drove around and around in my rented car, looking for Mung, and didn't see a single one. My friend Bill Selvage had told me one out of every six Merced residents was Mung, and it was on the strength of that prodigious statistic that I had come. I thought he must have made a mistake. The people who strolled their babies along the sycamore-lined avenues north of Bear Creek and gunned their pickups down the quaintly superannuated Main Street. I didn't know yet that most of the fancy business had shifted to the Merced Mall uptown. All looked as homegrown as characters from American Graffiti, which was set in Modesto, the next big town up Highway 99. When I stopped in the R Street Exxon for gas, I asked Frank, the man who windexed my windshield, whether he knew where the Mung lived. That part of town. Across the tracks is just crawling with them. Frank said, It's so crowded with monks you can't hardly move. I sure know we got a lot of them. What I don't know is why they're here. I mean, why did they pick Merced? He then volunteered an anecdote about some monk who had been caught fishing in a county lake without licenses. When the police came, they got down on their knees. They thought they were going to be executed. He threw back his head and laughed. Martin Kilgore told me later that Dumb Mung stories were a lamentable staple of Merced's agricultural community, some of whose members had hundred-year-old roots in the Central Valley. In Fresno, the Aggies make ethnic jokes about the Armenians. He said, In Stanislaus, it's the Portuguese. Here, it's the Hmong. There was the Hmong mother who heard a policeman say, If your child misbehaves, you can always chain him to the TV. And, took it literally. There were the Hmong farmers who fertilized their crops with human excrement. There were the Hmong tenants who punched holes in their walls to communicate with their relatives next door. There was the large Hmong family who lived in a one-bedroom, second-floor apartment. The American couple who lived below them complained that their roof was leaking. When the landlord checked, he found the Hmong had all moved into the bedroom, covered the floor of the living room with a foot of dirt, planted vegetables, and watered them. Who knew whether these stories were true? In the climate that had fostered Frank's genial bigotry, did it matter? As a Hmong proverb puts it, all kinds of vessels can be plugged, but you can't plug people's mouths. Over the last century and a half, the Central Valley had involuntarily swallowed wave after wave of foreign born settlers Mexicans, Chinese, Chileans, Irish, Dutch, Basques, Armenians, Portuguese, Swedes. Italians, Greeks, Japanese, Filipinos, Yemenites, East Indians, each had occasioned its own individually tailored flurry of xenophobia, of which the dumb Hmong stories were merely the most recent model. In the 1880s, the Anti Chinese Association of Merced had served a similar defensive purpose, provoked by the Cantonese who had come to pan gold along the Merced River and lay tracks for the Central Pacific Railroad and stayed to work in the brick factory near Bear Creek and run Fantan Parlors along 14th Street. So had the Merced County Anti-Japanese Association, which had tried to expel Japanese farmers in the 1920s. So had Merced's 200 to 1 vote, just before the end of World War II, against permitting Japanese Americans interned in relocation camps to return to their old homes. I followed Frank's directions and crossed the tracks of the Southern Pacific Railroad a freight line that parallels 16th Street in South Merced, which used to be Chinatown before it was raised in 1950 to make room for Highway 99. He was right, on the wrong side of the tracks. Everyone was Hmong, the first Hmong I had ever seen. In front of the dingy two-story apartment buildings, coveys of children were chasing each other, kicking balls, they had learned soccer at Ban Vinai, and playing TXWV, a form of jacks, in which pebbles are tossed and caught. The parking lots harbored more potted herbs than cars, and there were two community gardens, as dense and green as vest pocket rainforests, striped with rows of bok choy, bitter melon, and lemongrass. In a local grocery, Suahur and his wife, Yia Mua, sold 50 pound bags of rice, quail eggs, shredded squid, audio cassettes by local Hmong bands, sequins for decorating pine top, mentholated tape for treating headaches. Sticky ointments for treating bruises, camphor balm for drawing out fevers, and aromatic wood chips for making a tea that, as Yia Mua explained to me, flush out the bad dead blood after lady have baby. I had no idea at the time, but
but I had landed in the most intensely Hmong place in the United States. Fresno and Minneapolis St. Paul have larger Hmong populations, but Merced's Hmong constitute a far greater fraction of the local population. When I first visited Merced, the fraction, just as Bill Selvage had promised, was one-sixth. Now it is one-fifth. That critical mass. As Blaya Yao Mua put it, lets us keep more Hmong culture here than in Vientiane. Sometimes I felt that the other cities of the Central Valley, Fresno, Visalia, Porterville, Modesto, Stockton, Sacramento, Marysville, Yuba City, were mere suburbs of Merced. Hmong families constantly drove from city to city to visit relatives. And if they moved elsewhere in the valley, they returned to Merced for subclan gatherings. Just as residents of satellite settlements in Laos had returned to their home villages, with 14 Hmong clans, Chang, Fong, Hang, Her, Kong, Kyu, Li, Lor, Mua, Tao, Vang, Vu, Xiong, and Yang represented in Merced. Young people had no problem finding exogamous marriage partners. It was easy, even on short notice, to find its sieve neeb to negotiate with a pathogenic dab, an herbalist to concoct a healing to Zan, a clan elder to mediate a dispute, or a keech player to guide a dead person's soul back through the twelve heavens with his hauntingly resonant cluster of six steamed bamboo tubes. In Merced, where bamboo is hard to come by, keeches are sometimes made of PVC plumbing pipe. It is said that if the keech player is good, the soul will have no trouble following directions from the plastic. Asterisk. The. Anthropologist Eric Crystal once told a reporter for the Merced Sun Star how extraordinary it was to hear the Hmong language, spoken in the Kmart on J Street, when 15 years earlier it had been impossible to hear it anywhere in the Western world. Crystal is a former free speech activist who overflows with so many ideas and enthusiasms that he effervesces rather than converses. He has studied Merced's Hmong community, and he once curated a local exhibit of Hmong folk objects, bamboo vegetable baskets, opium harvesting knives, shamanic regalia. When I went to see Crystal in his office at U. C. Berkeley and told him I was living in Merced, he became so excited he started bouncing up and down in his chair. You're so lucky, he exclaimed. If I live down in that place, I'd be running around with the Hmong every minute. I mean, I just love Merced. Not that the Hmong aren't a hassle. They are. A huge hassle. When I first went down there they were kind of hostile. You know. What the hell do you want? Who the hell do you think you are? Fuck off. The mean are so delighted when anybody pays attention to them that they practically ask you to move in with them about two minutes. After you sit down. The Cambodians are really happy if you show that you are interested in Cambodia. But the Hmong, they just test you every minute. Once you pass the test. Though, they are fantastic. The Hmong are one of the best organized, most focused groups you could find any place on earth. They have the best leadership. They're the most able to cooperate among themselves. They're the most committed to preserving their ethnic identity. They're the most conscious of their own place in the world. You can see all that down in Merced. Those Hmong are really into being Hmong. The longer I spent in Merced, the more. Often I found myself asking. How in heaven's name could this have happened here? How could more than 10. 000 villagers from the mountains of Laos possibly be living in a place that hosted the Yosemite Dental Society, Smile Contest and the Romp Hen Stompers Square Dance, that sent out welcome newcomer kits, which no Hmong had ever requested, containing flyers for the Sweet Adeline Singers and the Senior Citizens Whittling Workshop, and that awarded ribbons. At its annual county fair for Best Infant Booties, Best Lemon Pie, and best utter. In other words, as Frank had asked, why did they pick Merced? The answer to that question, as I gradually found out, boiled down to two words, Dang Mua. It is probably a good thing that Frank does not know Dang, the indefatigable grocer, interpreter, and pig farmer who had once been a clerk typist at the American embassy in Vientiane. If Frank were to learn that, from the Hmong point of view Dang bears the same relation to Merced that Daniel Boone bore to Kentucky or the Pied Piper, bore to Koppelberg Hill. He might not be properly grateful. On the other hand, Dang might impress him by his almost unbelievably sedulous pursuit of the American dream. The first time I walked into Dang's office at California Customs Social Services, the interpreting and liaison agency he had founded, he was on the phone. He was talking rapidly in Hmong, but every once in a while, 
when he collided with a concept for which there was no Hmong equivalent. He threw in an English term, lack of communication, deposition, application, bank manager, conflict of interest. Dang was round-faced and sturdy, with a CEO's air of authoritative self-possession. He wore a large Casio watch that beeped and a large gold ring that said D. His business card was red, white, and blue. Commercial patriotism evidently ran in the family. His cousin, Mua Ki, whose office adjoined Dang's, supported his family largely by teaching Hmong about Christopher Columbus, Betsy Ross, and the advantages of the bicameral system in preparation for their naturalization examinations. Although he raised sacrificial pigs, Dang was selective in his spiritual dogmas, and for reasons of expedience he had excluded dabs. I call myself a multi-religious believer. He explained, I don't believe in ghost because I like to be the boss of the ghost. And if you are afraid of ghost, the ghost is your boss. It was clear that no one would ever be Dang's boss but Dang. Dang Mua and his family used to live in Richmond, Virginia, where they were the only Hmong. The first time they saw snow there, soon after they arrived from Thailand in early 1976, Dang thought someone had come while they were asleep and sprayed all the trees with salt. He worked 18 hours a day, 9, 0, 0 a, m, to 6, 0, 0 p, m, and 9, 0, 0 p, m, to 6, 0, 0 a, m. Folding newspapers, a job that took little advantage of his five languages and made him so a deep sleepy, as he put it, that he feared if he kept it up. I notice I must be dead in three years. He earned dollar two, ninety an hour. In his spare time, I have always wondered when that was, he went to the Richmond Library and read about prevailing climates, soil conditions, and crop yields in other states. His brother, who lived in Southern California, mentioned that the Central Valley had good weather and many different ethnic groups. Dang had heard through the Hmong grapevine that General Vang Pao was planning to buy a large fruit ranch near Merced, and that also influenced his decision. So I go buy a white 1970 stick shift hornet for $550. He recalled, I tell my sponsor from the American church. Tomorrow I will leave to California. He was very surprised. He say, you know, it's a robbery. It's an earthquake out there. But I say my mind is made. So then he say, you return that car and we will give you a V6 Cherokee. I say, I thank you for that but if I take your car I owe you something. They were so mad. Next morning, I burn some jaw stick and pray for my ancestor to lead me for a safe trip. My sponsor say, you don't need to do that. You should pray to the Lord. I say, your Lord let me have too many problem here in America. So I put a pan of water outside with some rice to pray to the God of the mountains. And my tears come. I never cry in my life. Not even going to Thailand. And that was hell. But now I cry. I say, I'm small but I am an adult person. I have to pursue now my plan. With the back end of his hornet nearly scraping the ground beneath the trunk full of clothing, pots, pans, dishes, and a television set, and the front end sticking up so high he could barely see over the hood, Dang drove his family west for two days and two nights on Interstate 40. Following the sun, he arrived in Merced with $34. It was mid-April 1977. The skies were so clear that he could see the coast range to the west and the Sierras to the east. The air was sweet with almond blossoms. In midsummer Merced is an oven, and in the winter, a chilling fog blows off the reservoir whose resident Dab, according to Fua, once caught her and followed her home. But in the spring, as Steinbeck's jodes were told as they approached the great green expanse, after making a journey much like the Muas, the Central Valley is the pettiest goddamn country you ever seen. There were miles and miles of ripe peaches and figs, which Dang got a job picking, and jackrabbits and squirrels he could easily trap for dinner. The town itself was clean and quiet, with an orderly grid of streets laid out by the Central Pacific Railroad in 1872. There were no beggars or derelicts, flat as a bowling green and 167 feet above sea level. Merced was in some ways an outlandish address for a Montagnard, but it was better than Richmond. And it was incalculably better than the slums of Hartford and Detroit, where some of Dang's clan's people lived. Most people drive through Merced N. Route from one place to another, Sacramento to Bakersfield, San Francisco to Yosemite, but to Dang, 
Worn beyond weariness by the journey from Laos to Thailand to Virginia to California, it was the long-desired terminus. Vang Pao's plan to buy the fruit ranch failed. Partly because the county board of supervisors had public misgivings about the refugees it might attract and partly because the general had an inauspicious dream the night before he was to sign the contract. Nonetheless, the favorable buzz about Merced and the rest of the Central Valley had already spread to discontented Hmong communities across the United States. A trickle, and then a flood, of dilapidated cars began to stream in from the east. It was just wild. Recalled Eric Crystal. You'd see these Arkansas plates and stuff on the streets. I mean they were just pouring in from all over the place. Merced is incredible now. But it was particularly incredible then. It is doubtless easier to wax enthusiastic about the Hmong of Merced if you are a visiting anthropologist, than if you are a resident taxpayer. Spose a fella got work and is saved. Couldn't he get a little land? Tom Joad had asked. And he was told. You ain't gonna get no steady work. So it was with the Hmong, who couldn't get the high-end agricultural jobs because they had no English and no experience and couldn't get the low-end ones because Mexican migrants had already filled them. At first the Merced Sunstar treated the newcomers like exotic guests, though it was cherry of printing the word Hmong, which could be found in no atlas or dictionary. Local reporters called the Hmong the Laotians Dang Mua's five languages were a local dialect. Laotian. Thai. French and English. Soon, however, the Hmong, for whom the codeword became refugees, started to make headlines. Refugees drained limited services, refugee students jammed the schools, supervisors hired by meager state funds allocated for area refugees, more dollar 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 needed for refugees. More dollar 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 were needed because of an economic catastrophe that began in Merced in the early 80s and continues today. Merced was never rich. During the last three decades it has ranked between number 35 and number 53 of California's 58 counties. In poor capita income, it was limping along comfortably enough. However, until the Hmong came, an event that happened to coincide with a nationwide recession as well as deepening cutbacks in both federal and state social programs. 79% of the Hmong in Merced County, as compared with 18% of the county's other residents, receive public assistance. By 1995, Merced had achieved the unwanted distinction of having a greater fraction of its population on welfare than any other county in the state. The federal government picks up half the welfare costs, the state picks up 47.5%, and the county picks up 2.5%. That 2.5% sounds like a pittance, but in recent years, it has amounted to nearly $2 million annually, two and a half times as much as it was in 1980 to which is added nearly a million dollars in administrative costs, while scrambling to meet its other financial obligations. The county has found those millions by closing three libraries, ceasing to maintain 21 of its 24 parks, leaving five sheriff posts vacant, increasing the caseloads of all six of its judges, reducing the staff of its probation department, reducing road maintenance, cutting the budgets for arts and culture, recreation, senior citizens programs, and veterans' services, and transferring all its fire departments to the State Department of Forestry. The Welfare Reform Bill, if it is not revised, will only make matters worse by forcing the county, which is unlikely to let its residents starve, to make up for at least some of the evaporated federal funds. I asked a county social worker what would happen if neither the bill nor the demographics of Merced's population were to change. Bankruptcy, she said. Of course. The Hmong are not solely, or even primarily, responsible. For Merced's fiscal crisis, Merced has plenty of white and Hispanic welfare recipients. They occasion less notice and less resentment than the Hmong because, although their numbers are large, their percentages are small. That is, most of the Hmong are on welfare, and most of the members of Merced's other ethnic groups are not. And although welfare has become the most conspicuous focal point for public rage, Merced County has been simultaneously strained by several other even more expensive problems. The accelerating transfer of agricultural work from people to machines, double-digit unemployment, about three times the national level, almost every month since 1980, the 1995 closing of Castle Air Force Base, which had provided more than a thousand jobs to local residents, 
and a 1992 restructuring of California sales and property taxes that returned more to the state and less to the county. The crucial distinction is that you cannot see a restructured property tax, but when you drive down almost any street on the south side, you can certainly see the Hmong. In a county where 7 out of 10 people voted for Proposition 187, California's 1994 referendum to ban public services to illegal immigrants. Even legal immigrants are unlikely to be received with open arms. That is not to say that everyone in Merced grumbles about the Hmong. The local churches have always treated them generously, and a small but fervent core of well-educated professionals, most of them liberal transplants from other cities, concur with Jeff McMahon, a young reporter at the Sun Star who told me, the one thing that makes Merced different from every other dusty little town in the Central Valley is that there are so many Southeast Asians here. Their culture is a blessing to this community. How else would Merced ever earn a place in history? The Sun Star now features a cultural diversity page, and the tourist brochure distributed by the Merced Chamber of Commerce includes, next to pictures of the county courthouse and the local wildlife museum's stuffed polar bear, a photograph of a smiling Hmong woman, albeit dressed in a Lacoste polo shirt, holding a dazzlingly green armful of lettuce and string beans, especially during the 80s when the Hmong were novel and exciting. Many of Merced's women rallied to their cause. Volunteers in the Befriender Refugee Program took Hmong families to the Applegate Zoo and invited them to backyard barbecues. Dan Murphy's wife, Cindy, taught Hmong women how to use sewing machines and self-cleaning ovens. Jan Harwood, a 4-H club youth advisor, organized a course, locally referred to as the Tidy Bowl class, to train Hmong women for housekeeping jobs. Jan's interpreter, a man named Pa Vu Tao was so impressed by the enthusiasm with which she demonstrated the use of Lysol, Comet, and Spick and Span that when Jan broke her leg, he reciprocated by gathering moss from the 4-H camp's trees and teaching her how to make an herbal compress to reduce the swelling. The warmest welcome I ever saw the Hmong receive was a naturalization ceremony, held in the boardroom of the Merced County Administrative Building, in which 18 Hmong, as well as two lowland Lao, nine Mexicans, five Portuguese, three Filipinos, two Vietnamese, two Indians, a Thai, a Korean, a Chinese, an Austrian, and a Cuban, became American citizens. Each received a copy of the Constitution, a history of the Pledge of Allegiance, a picture of the Statue of Liberty, a congratulatory letter from the President of the United States, a little American flag and, courtesy of Lodge No. 1240 of the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks, Unlimited Free Soft Drinks. Standing next to a mounted copy of the Merced County song, we are known for sweet potatoes and milk and chickens two tomatoes and alfalfa and almonds great to chew, Judge Michael Hyder told the assembled multitude, many of whom could not understand a word but listened respectfully nonetheless. We've all come together from many places to form one great country, including myself for my father, was a naturalized citizen who came from Lebanon, in America. You don't have to worry about police breaking down your doors. You can practice any religion you want. There's such complete freedom of the press that our newspapers can even attack our leaders. If the government feels they need your land, they cannot just take it away from you. Most importantly, every one of you has the same opportunity as the person sitting next to you. My father never could have dreamed that his son would be a judge. Your children can be doctors. I just get carried away when I talk about how wonderful it is to be a citizen of the United States. Congratulations. You're one of us. But while I was listening to Judge Hyder, I thought of a conversation I had had not long before with Dr. Robert Small, the unfalteringly opinionated MCMC obstetrician, whose views are shared by a large segment of Merced's population. I and my friends were outraged when the Hmong started coming here. He told me. Outraged. Our government, without any advice or consent, just brought these non-working people into our society. Why should we get them over anybody else? I've got a young Irish friend who wants to get a U.S. education and wants to work. He can't get in. But these Hmong just kind of fly here in groups and settle like locusts. They know no shame. Being on the dole. They're happy here. When I mentioned the high rate of depression among Hmong refugees, Dr. Small said. What do you mean? This is heaven for them. They have a toilet they can poop in. They can drink water from an open faucet. 
they get regular checks and they never have to work. It's absolute heaven for these people. Poor souls. I had also spoken with the more temperate John Cullen, director of the Merced Human Services Agency, which administers public assistance. Merced has been a fairly conservative, waspy community for many years. He said, the other nationalities that are part of our community came here over a long period of time, but the Hmong came in one big rush. They were a jolt to the system, that inevitably causes more of a reaction, and they do take more than their share of the county's income. You can't deny that the county has been seriously, seriously impacted. I think Merced's reaction to the Hmong is a matter of water swamping the boat, not a matter of racism. On occasion, however, it is a matter of racism. One day Dang Mua was walking out of his grocery store, the Mua Oriental Food Market, when a man he had never seen before drove by and started yelling at him. He is maybe 40-year-old. D person. Recalled Dang. He is driving 84 Datsun. He say to me, Shit man. Why you come to this country? Why didn't you die in Vietnam? Well, my father always say to me, If someone act like a beast to you, you must act like a person to him. So I try to smile and be nice. I say, I'm a citizen just like you are. I say, give me your phone number. You come to my house and eat Hmong food and we talk two or three hour. But he run away. Maybe he is veteran and he convince I am enemy. Dang's hypothesis is not as far-fetched as it sounds. Many people in Merced have confused the Hmong with the Vietnamese, including the former mayor, Marvin Wells, who once informed a Chamber of Commerce luncheon that the a Vietnam refugees in California were a problem. It is not uncommon to hear the Hmong called boat people, although Laos is landlocked, and the only boat most Hmong are likely to have seen was the bamboo raft on which they floated, under fire, across the Mekong River. At least the real boat people, the former South Vietnamese, were United States allies. A more unsettling assumption was revealed by the MCMC maintenance man who, conflating the Hmong with the Viet Cong, told Dave Schneider that the hospital was patronized by too many fucking gooks. Over and over again, the Hmong here take pains to explain that they fought for the United States, not against it. Dang Mua is a one-man public relations outfit, constantly hauling out an old National Geographic with a picture of his uncle in a military uniform, or popping a videotape about the army clandestine into his VCR. One man from a nearby Central Valley town made sure that even after his death there could be no mistake about his past. His tombstone in the Toll House Cemetery northeast of Fresno, where dozens of Hmong, reminded of Laos by the hilly topography, chose to be buried until local residents started complaining about their loud funerals, reads. Beloved Father and Grandfather, Chua Cha Cha. April 20th, 1936. February 27th. 1989, he served for the C. I. A. From 1961 to 1975. In 1994, there was a demonstration in Fresno by Hmong welfare recipients, many of whom were former soldiers, protesting a new requirement that they work 16 hours a week in public service jobs, which they called slavery. Like older Hmong across the country who still believed in the promise, the CIA's alleged compensation contract, they assumed. That aid with no strings attached was no more than their proper due. They expected the Americans to be grateful for their military service. The Americans expected them to be grateful for their money. And each resented the other for not acting beholden. In the director's conference room at the Merced Human Services Agency, there hangs a huge pine top that tells the story of the end of the war in Laos. In a series of embroidered and appliqued images, Hmong families tried to crowd into four American airplanes at Long Tiang walk to Thailand carrying huge loads on their backs, attempt to swim across a wide river, settle in Ban Vinai, and, finally, load their belongings onto a bus that will take them to an airplane bound for the United States. Across from the pine top there is a computer from which the welfare files of thousands of Hmong can be accessed. The Lees, like many Hmong families whose records have been kept here, are intimately familiar with the grief chronicled by the pine top, but oblivious to the anger induced by the computer files. When I asked Fua and now Kao how they felt about being on welfare, Fua said, I am afraid the welfare will go away. I am afraid to look for a job because I am afraid I could not do it. I am afraid we would not have food to eat. Now Kao said, In Laos we had our own animals and our own farm and our own house. 
and then we had to come to this country, and we are poor and we have to have welfare, and we have no animals and no farm, and that makes me think a lot about our past. Neither of them said a word about what Americans might think of them for not working. For them, that was not the issue. The issue was why the American war had forced them to leave Laos and, via a reluctant trajectory that would have been unimaginable to their parents or their parents' parents, wind up in, of all places, Merced. Sometimes I felt that the Hmong of Merced were like one of those visual perception puzzles. If you looked at it one way you saw a vase. If you looked at it another way you saw two faces. And whichever pattern you saw, it was almost impossible, at least at first glance, to see the other. From one angle, the welfare statistics looked appalling. From another, it was possible to make out small but measurable signs of progress. That during the past decade, despite the periodic arrival of new JOJs from Thailand, the public assistance rate had declined by 5%. That more than 300 graduates of government-funded job training programs were now operating sewing machines, making furniture, assembling electronic components, and working in other local industries. That dozens of local Hmong women had started taking English classes following a 1995 change in federal welfare regulations, a warm-up to the 1996 bill, that required both parents and intact families to study or work unless there was a child under three or a disabled family member. At home, the requirement to a work would be more effective if Merced actually had jobs. When you looked at the Merced school system, what you saw again depended on your point of view. From one perspective, the Hmong children who multiplied at a rate that made Dr. Small just shake his head and keep muttering the word contraception were a disaster. In order to relieve overcrowding and to desegregate schools that would otherwise be almost entirely Asian, Merced has had to bus nearly two. 000 of its elementary and middle school students build three new elementary schools, a new middle school, and a new high school, teach classes in more than 70 trailers and, while waiting for them to arrive, in cafeterias, on auditorium stages, and in the exhibition hall of the county fairgrounds, and switch seven schools to a staggered all-year calendar. On the other hand, Hmong children rarely caused disciplinary problems and regularly crowded the honor rolls. Asterisk four of the Lee children received their class's Student of the Month awards. Rick Eubner, who taught May Lee's 8th grade language arts class, once wrote me a letter that described May as a leader among her peers and a clear-thinking, confident person. He continued, Almost exclusively, the Hmong are hard-working, quick-learning students. Their parents are eager to attend conferences. In spite of language barriers, on many occasions students have acted as interpreters for their parents and me. Typically the parents thank me for teaching their child. Ask if he or she is working hard enough. Wonder if there is any problem with the child showing proper. Respect and inquire if there is anything that they can do at home to help. At a conference I attended on college and career planning for Hmong teenagers. Jonas Vange, standing under a sign that said education. The key to your future told his almost preternaturally quiet audience. In America, even when the child is in the stomach, the mother thinks about books and pencils. Your parents grew with knife or hammer or tool. They cannot help you. Let your book be your best friend. For if you cannot learn in school, whose fault is it? Who is to blame? No one said a word. Answer me, thundered Jonas. Finally, in a small voice, a boy said, Yourself. Right, said Jonas, do not be afraid. If you are a chicken boy or chicken girl, and you keep quiet, the examination will come and you will fail. Those who cannot learn cannot be successful. We want you to be successful in the year 2000. There was silence in the room. Then the students burst, or crept, into muted applause. Although many Hmong teenagers in Merced are as wholesome and deferential as those in Jonas's audience, a few have joined the Men of Destruction, the Blood Asian Crips, the Oriental Locks, or one of the other gangs which, in a perverse distortion of the group ethic, started spreading through the Central Valley in the mid-80s. Merced has black and Hispanic gangs as well, but local police officers agree that the Hmong gangs are the most likely to carry guns and the most likely to use them. I occasionally heard mutterings about Hmong gangs, but local residents W.H. Oh dislike the Hmong seem to be far more obsessed with smaller, 
Stranger crimes. I was told countless times that the Hmong kidnapped underage brides. I also heard that they smuggled drugs. The local police department confirmed that opium had been found. Inside axe handles, picture frames, bamboo chairs, tea bags, and packages of noodles. There were also many tales about fish and game violations. The Merced Sunstar ran an article about Hmong who poached bass from the San Luis Reservoir with one. 550 foot set lines, drove deer into ambushes by banging on pots and pans, and served stewed pie bill grebe for dinner. None of these stories was false, but they were all partial, left out of the telling were all. The extenuating circumstances that Hmong marriage customs had a cultural context unfamiliar to Americans, asterisk that opium smuggling was uncommon, and most of the contraband was intended for medicinal use by the elderly, that in Laos. All the hill tribes had hunted and fished without rules, seasons, or limits, and that once they reached adulthood, the Hmong here, as in other parts of the country, had a low overall crime rate compared with other people. Below the poverty line. The most frequent accusation I heard was that the Hmong were terrible drivers. They seemed fine to me, so I went to the Department of Motor Vehicles and asked John McDonnell, the manager, what he thought. He said, in many respects I am happy to have these people as neighbors, but as far as driving ability goes, well, that's another matter. Violations of pedestrian right-of-way. Going through stop signs. Not realizing their speed. All errors of judgment. Also, when they come to get their licenses, some of them cheat on the written test. How do they cheat? I asked. They so, said Mr. McDonnell. They so, Mr. McDonnell who wore trifocals and looked a little like Edwin, opened the top left drawer of his desk. Well, the ones who don't know English can't read the questions, and they answer at random and take the corrected answer sheets home and share them with their friends. Some of them just memorized the dots on the page. Five different tests. 46 questions. Three answers, let me see. 46 times 15 is 690 dots. They're very good at memorization but that's an awful lot of dots. So quite a few of them bring in these little cribs. He reached in the drawer and took out an eyeglass case. In flawless cross stitch, a different color for each of the test's five versions, a pine top artist had sewn microscopic X's. To indicate whether, for each question, the correct answer was the first, second, or third option. Next he took out a checked coat. On each lapel, certain squares had been blocked in with thread. Next he took out a striped pullover with almost invisible white stitches down the front and along each sleeve. Next he took out a white shirt with minute blue stitches on the cuffs. Real neat work, isn't it? He said admiringly. I concurred. Then I asked, what do you do when you catch someone using one of these? He fails the test. And we confiscate the crib. It occurred to me that an awful lot of Hmong must exit from the Department of Motor Vehicles wearing fewer clothes. Then when they walked in. Late that night, I lay on the floor in Bill Selvage's study, where I was staying. Next to my sleeping bag I had taped photographs of Hmong. Hmong children from the National Geographic wearing Pine Top. Hmong teenagers from the Merced Sunstar wearing jeans. The Lee family. Wearing slightly off-kilter American clothes. In pictures I had taken myself. I found them all very beautiful. And I often stared at them for hours when I couldn't sleep. That night, for some reason, the phrase, differently abled, a substitute for, disabled that had enjoyed a brief vogue among progressive journalists, kept buzzing around my head. I had always disliked. The term, which struck me as euphemistic and patronizing. Suddenly, I realized why it was keeping me awake. I had been trying all day to decide whether I thought the Hmong were ethical or unethical. And now I saw it. They were, in this case. It was a supremely accurate phrase, differently ethical. The Hmong, it seemed to me, were abiding. In spades. By E. M. Forster's famous dictum that it is better to betray one's country than one's friend. Since. They had never had a nation of their own. And had been persecuted by every nation they had inhabited. They could hardly be expected to harbor an extravagant respect for national jurisprudence. Rules and regulations were particularly breakable if they conflicted with the group ethic, which, after all, is an ethic, not just an excuse to flout someone else's ethic. Hmong folktales are heavily populated with characters, 
clearly meant to be perceived as virtuous, who lie to kings, dragons, dabs, and other authority figures in order to protect their families or friends. I had heard innumerable modern versions in which some synecdochical representative of the U.S. government had played the role of righteously deceived dab. In the Thai camps, Hmong had claimed their children were older than they really were, so they could receive larger food allotments, claimed their parents were younger than they really were, because it was rumored that the United States considered old people undesirable, and told immigration officials that collateral relatives were members of their immediate families. In the United States, they had claimed their children were younger than they really were, so they could stay in school longer, lied to doctors in order to get disability benefits, claimed they had separated from a spouse in order to increase the family's welfare allowance, and, among the younger generation, let friends copy their schoolwork. Not all the Hmong I knew had done these things, most had not, but those who had were unashamed. In fact, the ones who had lied to immigration officials had been amazed. When they reached the United States and discussed their experiences with their American sponsors, to find that their behavior was regarded as unethical, what would have seemed unethical, in fact, unpardonable, to them was leaving their relatives behind. Now Cao Li, who couldn't read a word of English, had passed his driving test, in precisely the manner John McDonnell had described, by memorizing where to place the X's on his answer sheet. He had been asked to make a set of prescribed pencil marks. He had done so. In fact, his success on the test, which seemed to him a purely technical challenge, not an assessment of his ability to drive safely, was a triumph of intelligence over bureaucracy. However, it never would have occurred to him to go to so much trouble if he had been able to pass by conventional methods. Not long after my conversation with John McDonnell, the California Department of Motor Vehicles instituted oral and written tests in Hmong, and the rate of cheating among Hmong applicants declined to a level comparable with that of Merced's other ethnic groups. Now Cao viewed his driver's license as a matter of patent necessity. How else was he to visit his relatives? The family came first, then the clan, then the Hmong people, and everything and everybody else ranked so far below those three that it would have been blasphemy to mention them in the same breath. I believe that now Cao, like most Hmong, would rather die than deceive a member of his family or clan. The group ethic enabled now Cao not only to pass his driving test, but to make unequivocal decisions in every sphere of his life, to assess people's characters with confidence, and to operate almost entirely within the supportive Hmong community rather than within the larger and harsher world of America. On a larger scale, the exigent pull of ethnic solidarity was what made the Hmong so open handed so good at teamwork, and so warm, but it seemed to me that, especially for the community's educated leaders, the obligation to put the group before the self also had some negative consequences, stress, loss of privacy, a punishing sense of responsibility, now Cao's age and his lack of English insulated him from the conflicts and ambiguities of having one foot in one culture, and one in another, his life, if not joyous, was at least clear. This was not the case with the Hmong who shared high status in both the Hmong and the American communities. Dang Mua was an exception. He had so much forward momentum that stresses and doubts simply flowed off him, like water from a torpedo. Also, although Dang spent many hours doing what nearly all literate, English-speaking Hmong of his generation did, deciphering other people's junk mail, filling out their tax forms, telephoning agencies, Translating notes from school, he charged for these tasks. Most Hmong did them for free. I heard about one multilingual woman, once a nursing administrator in Xiankuang province, who had worked as a Hmong liaison after settling in Minnesota. She became so exhausted by the incessant demands of the Twin Cities Hmong community, both during and after work hours, that she moved to Merced without telling her clan and got a job that allowed her to deal only with Americans. Don't call her. I was told. She's trying to lie low. Family loyalty, the group ethic concentrated to an even more potent form, also. Had its downside. Pa Vu Tao, the interpreter who had made an herbal compress to heal Jan Harwood's broken leg, told me he had once been offered a lucrative job at U. C. Davis. He had turned it down. With regret but without hesitation. After his father, angry that Pa Vu would even consider leaving his relatives in Merced, asked him. Does money mean more or does the family mean more? 
In the early 70s, out of the more than 300, 000 Hmong in Laos, there were only 34, all men, who were studying at universities overseas. Two of them had resettled in Merced, Blaya Yao Mua and Jonas Vongay. Both had won scholarships to the Lycée National, Vientiane's most elite secondary school, and had obtained bachelor's and master's degrees from French universities. Jonas left a job as a computer analyst in a Paris suburb to immigrate to the United States in 1983, just after the largest wave of Hmong refugees, most of them illiterate farmers like the Lees, had been admitted. Blyat came the same year, leaving an executive position at an international packaging company. I move here to help because it was my moral responsibility. He told me, if my generation stay in France, we would feel guilty. Blaya and Jonas were more intellectually cosmopolitan not only than every monk they knew, but also than every American they knew, including myself. Their leadership roles in Merced had earned both of them respect, but little money, and, as far as I could see, little peace of mind. I knew Blaya Yaomua best. There was a period of a few months when I spent almost every afternoon sitting in his office, a windowless cubicle with fake wood paneling, asking questions about Hmong religion, military history, medical practices, kinship patterns, weddings, funerals, music, clothing, architecture, and gastronomy. It was from Blaya that I learned, for example, that if I wronged another person, I might be reborn in my next life as my victim's buffalo and used for farm work. That what American doctors called the Mongolian spot, a bluish birthmark on the buttocks of many Asian babies, was in fact the place where the babies had been spanked, in utero, by a dab. And that the shoes Hmong corpses wore for burial had upturned toes. Blaya looked like a frayed aristocrat, with a high domed forehead and finely drawn features. Although he was almost exactly my age, in his mid-thirties when we first met, I always felt like a child in his presence. Partly because I sat in a chair with a tiny desk attached. The way I had in sixth grade. And partly because he knew so much more than I did and was so patient with my ignorance. I remember countless occasions. After I had asked him to provide a rational explanation. For a non-rational custom. When he just shook his head gently and said. Anne. May I explain to you again. The Hmong culture is not Cartesian. Blaya was the executive director of Lao Family Community, a mutual assistance organization that helped Merced's Hmong community negotiate the public assistance labyrinth, apply for job training, resolve community conflicts, and keep abreast of news from Laos and Thailand. Asterisk it was quartered in an old truck depot. Near the Kmart, signs on the wall, next to Hmong language handouts on fair housing laws and disability insurance said please help yourself out and you may wanted news. The Hmong community might not always meet the expectations of the American community, but it certainly knew how to run itself. Blaya once drew me a flowchart, which was Cartesian, delineating how his organization worked. At the top is the president and advisory board of eight. He explained. Then eleven board of director. Then seventeen district leaders. Then our six. Zero 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 members. Let us say we need a hundred dollars to help out person who will be evicted. The 17 district leaders carry the news. And everyone donate 5 cents or 10 cents. Tomorrow we get that money. Or if one person die, tomorrow money will flow back to help that family. If there is change in welfare rules, we get out information the same way. If someone have problem with their child, we can solve problem inside Hmong community before it gets to the police. This way. 6. 000 people we can serve with four or five people working in our office. No problem. No problem. That is, if those four or five people had no private life whatsoever. Blaya's eyes were often puffed and bloodshot from lack of sleep. Once he came to work after staying up all night mediating between the Merced police and among family who, while bringing a sacrificed pig home from Fresno, had had a traffic accident that distributed parts of the pig across the northbound lanes of Highway 99. He spent another night dealing with three teenaged girls who had run away from their homes in Fresno and stolen some money from an uncle in Merced. After persuading the uncle not to report the theft to the police, Blaya took the girls home, woke his pregnant wife, and asked her to cook them a meal while they waited. For their parents. The parents were not grateful. They are angry because I should have acted more severely. He told me. I did not know until they arrive. 
but I am related to all those families by my clan and my wife's clan. That is terrible. In our culture, this means I have same duty as parents to give the children a lesson. I should have spanked them. I did not do my right duty. I saw Blaya's face light up only once. The time he described an ambitious housing scheme he had conceived. I would like to share with you what we are dreaming of for the future. He said, some of us hope to establish a Mungtown on the other side of Childs and Girard Avenues. If we can make the financial package to buy this land, we can build two, three hundred houses. The Mung house in Laos has a cross like an X at the top. We can do that here too. Each family can have a small garden. We can have our own Mung shopping. Center. Our Mung town will boost morale because people will take good care of it. We will lose face if white person is seeing that Mung town is dirty. Having our own town will help Hmong people to become more economically self-sufficient. If this dream can come true, this will be very good for Hmong image. But when I came back to Merced a year later, no one had heard of Hmong town, and Blaya had resigned from his job at Lao Family Community and was selling insurance door-to-door. -door. An American who knew him told me, Blaya is the most burned-out Hmong I ever saw. He later moved to St. Paul, Minnesota where he counsels Asian students and teaches a course on Hmong culture at Metropolitan State University. His telephone number is now unlisted. Like Blaya, Jonas Vange translated, mediated, counseled, and interceded on 24-hour call. At the end of his speech at the college and career conference, I had attended. Jonas had told his teenaged audience, call me anytime during the day or night, and I knew that he would be taken literally. He had heavy family responsibilities as well, explaining to me once why his family shared their home with two of his brothers, one of whom had nine children. He said, I have another older brother who is very American now. He refused to accept our brothers to live with him. He say, here in the United States, it is everyone for himself. I say, I am Hmong. For the Hmong, it is never everyone for himself. Jonas was thin and wiry and handsome. although. Like almost every well-educated Hmong I knew, he always looked dog-tired. His real name was Vang Na. He had changed it to Jonas Vange when he was living in France, because he thought that his resume would garner more job offers if he did not sound so Asian. He now had two jobs. As a bilingual education specialist for the Merced school system and as a Hmong language teacher at Merced College, I used to talk to him, using a mixture of English and French in an elementary school classroom, seated again at a child's desk. I never asked a question about Hmong history or linguistics that he was unable to answer. Because, like Blaya, Jonas was always busy but never turned me away. I decided to find a way to thank him for his help. Should I give him a gift? This seemed hazardous. He might feel he should reciprocate. Also, I didn't trust my gift-selecting instincts. Once, in an attempt to bridge the miles between Laos, Merced, and New York City, I had given Fla and Nao Kao a small plastic globe, only to find that they believed the earth was flat. Should I invite Jonas and his wife to Bill Selvage's house? This might confuse them. There was no recognized Hmong category for platonic friends who shared living quarters. Why don't you invite them to a nice restaurant? Suggested Bill. So one evening, at 7, 0, zero sharp. I sat waiting for Jonas in the lounge at a local steakhouse called the Cask Den Cleaver. He had told me his wife could not join us because she had to take care of their children. I suspected he might also be embarrassed because her English was rudimentary. The restaurant's hostess, who wore a silver lame top and a miniskirt, asked me whom I was waiting for. A Hmong man who has helped me with my work, I said. The hostess looked surprised. I just moved to Merced. She said, and I don't know nothing about the Mongs. I just saw my first one today. My boyfriend said, that's a Hmong. I said, how can you tell the difference? They look just like Chinamen to me. My boyfriend says they're the worst drivers in the world. When he sees one, he goes clear across town to stay away from them. I guess Mongs don't come to restaurants like this very often. They sure don't. I thought, and by the way, you're not fit to polish Jonas's boots. Jonas arrived 45 minutes late, saying he had been delayed by a student. I never knew if he had known from the start that he couldn't make it at 7, and had agreed to the time because he thought that was what I wanted to hear, or whether, the story of his life, he had once again been 
pulled in two mutually exclusive directions. The dinner was not a success. Despite his five languages, Jonas had difficulty understanding the waitress, a teenager who spoke Rapid Valley Girl, and had to ask me several times what she was saying, out of politeness, certainly not from lack of sophistication, since he had eaten at plenty of Parisian restaurants that would make the cask and cleaver look like McDonald's. He ordered the cheapest entree on the menu. Our conversation was formal and halting. Jonas was obviously relieved when we left. Afterwards, we stood in the parking lot, talking in the dark. You know, Anne, he said quietly, when I am with a Hmong or a French or an American person, I am always the one who laughs last at a joke. I am the chameleon animal. You can place me any place, and I will survive, but I will not belong. I must tell you that I do not really belong anywhere. Then, Jonas drove home to his wife, his three children, his brothers, his brothers' wives, his brothers' ten children, and his ringing telephone.